Welcome back to Detections Podcast and our new intro music uh, with your hosts, XL Detrades and Understudy 77. So, new music. Yes, new music. <laughs> I have listened to it approximately <laughs> one time. I hope all of you just rewind and listen again and rewind yeah. and listen again and rewind and listen again, but eventually get to the content because yeah. that would be helpful. Uh, uh, that's what you're here for, too, is the content. Um, I yeah, mean, no. we don't know that. <laughs> they, people can listen to the, maybe they just want to listen to the intro song and then they want to roll out. That's okay well, too. Like it's, a, it's your priority, man. But at least the uh, the intro and outro make us look professional at this point. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a big difference between looking and being. But sure. <laughs> Thank you for recognizing the serve. Of course. <laughs> so do you want to do you want to give some credit to the uh, designer here and talk a little bit about that? Uh, I will. I will once I uh, get his confirmation. That's okay to share the name. Okay, uh, but it was a friend of mine who did this, and uh, this friend is actually uh, since he's also on this social distancing uh, from his school. His school sh- uh, shutting down for the most part. Uh, he's going to be spending time doing his music project. So uh, once I get a confirmation from him, we'll also give a shout out to his music project that he is recording while stuck in his apartment. That's awesome. So you know what's really cool about shout outs? We got one. Another one? Another one. Well, I don't know. Like, have we gotten more than one? Well, there was the the oh crap, I can't remember her name. The, uh, the last time I recorded uh, before Jeff. Oh, the, the the blog post? Yeah, the blog post that Yeah, but that wasn't us. for us. That was for me being mad on Twitter. This one's for <laughs> detections. It makes us legitimate. So Capsule 8, a brilliant article written by CatSuite called No More Tears, Reimagining the Structure of SecOps. We'll link it. It'll be there. You can see it. But there's a whole section in there kind of talking about, like, the people who, from the Detections podcast, like, have this opinion. And it was cool. So, uh, like... It, it's a good article. I read it, too. Um, it is. Yeah, it's it's well worth the time to read. And it's not like a most blog posts where it's, like, 10 sentences popcorn kind of reading like it's a it's a sit down and you know give yourself a a fair bit amount of time to to chew through it yeah it's really well thought out it's really well written so shout out to them not not only for writing it because i think it was amazing like a really good read either way but like another big shout out like hey like thanks for like listening to our podcast and uh, have like thinking that that was cool and referencing it in your blog like i appreciate that that means a lot to me and then at the same point, it baffles me that someone thinks anything that either one of us says is intelligent enough to quote in a blog post. Well, I'm not disagreeing <laughs> with that, but, you know, apparently it happens and it's super cool, but I still don't understand it. Yeah. Um, so, you know what else I don't understand on that note? And I, for anybody who went to B-Sides Nova, especially if you came to my talk, I have to say thank you. So they put me in a room that could hold 74 people. Right. There was over 100 people in the room for my talk, which I mean, I've I've had like relatively full talks before. I have never had that, though. Like that was such a cool experience. But there were downsides too. like it was super hot. Yeah. Like very, very warm in that room. Um, So warm, in fact, that that one of my fellow paranoids um, and I'm going to name him Mr. Sean Porras, who also gave a talk that was really good about the bug bounty life cycle. I think we're going to have him come on detections and chat with us about like running the world's biggest bug bounty program. Cause that would be cool. Um, he got me a bottle of water. And then when he saw that my bottle of water was almost empty, like he snuck up to this, to the desk, he grabbed it, he went and refilled it and then brought me another one. So like hat tip to that guy. Cause like, that's a fucking friend. Absolutely. Also, he listens to this. So like, I'm hoping that his face is like beat red and he's all embarrassed <laughs> and shit. And then he can send you a picture. Uh, yeah, but it was, it was such a good talk. Like I love giving that introduction to malware analysis talk. I always get such a good group of people who ask questions and who are interested and engaged of all of any of the talks that I've ever given in my career. That is the one that engages the most people. And that is one of my favorite ones to give because it's just so much fun. And like people get so involved in the conversation and asking questions and stuff. <clears throat> so like huge thanks to the B-Sides Nova crew and everybody who came out to the talk and all the friends that I saw 
and Blind Hacker for giving me shit while I was on stage. I expect nothing less. And my team for giving me shit while I was on stage. <laughs> All that. Like, it was just really uh, fucking cool. And who knows? Uh, with the uh, postponement of Charm, uh, maybe we'll be able to give each other shit in person later yes. this year. And hopefully maybe record an episode while we're there. Yes. Like right next to each other, like a special <laughs> edition um, detections. Now, uh, what you said about your talk uh, uh, lets me know something uh, about what people are hungry for, right? That introductory stuff. Like we've mentioned it and we've talked about it a lot both on the show and, uh, you know, separately to one another. But the the introductory level stuff people want to see. Dude, I've... I felt that way for a long time. Like, it's not just about this concept of like, oh, let me show how cool I am. It's, it's like teaching somebody like the talks were some where they teach, especially the introductory stuff. Like it seems to draw crowds. It's not that I'm special because I'm fucking not, Mm -hmm. but like the, the topic, like I try to make it accessible and I try to get it so that anybody can come. And like, I try to really teach it. Like I would like was giving like a lecture for a class or something to teach. And like that draws people and that's super cool to me. Like there's so much desire for that kind of content and so few people who I think want to present that kind of content. Yeah. Which uh, was going to lead me to say, uh, if any of the listeners, that's a place to step out of. That's a thing that you want to try the, the public presentation speaking, think about just starting with the introductory stuff. Like, uh, things that you learned when you first started getting in the industry or things that you've learned as you're trying to break into it. That's relevant stuff that people are hungry for. And trust me, if I can do it, so can you, because I'm an idiot. (laughs) I mean, I wouldn't say an idiot. Like, that's, I'm clever. But, like, I'm by in no way, shape, or form the most technical person in any fucking room of InfoSec people. Like, that's just not who I am these days or anymore, right? So, like, if I can do it, like, you can too. Trust me. So, So. uh, do we have uh, any more announcements that we wanted to share? I think that brings us into the news. Yes, it does. So I think I have a couple more, so I can kick it off if you like. Yeah, I was just going to say, you've got a few more, so kick it off. Cool. So first off, you know, we talked a couple weeks ago or a couple months ago, or they're blending together now um, about some of the laws that are coming out that kind of like potentially could put researchers in jeopardy of legal stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's a new U.S. bill aiming to protect researchers who disclose government backdoors. Um, It is an amend amendment of the Espionage Act of 1917. That protects journalists, whistleblowers, and security researchers who discover and disclose classified government information. It's basically to amend it so that it cannot be used to target reporters, whistleblowers, and security researchers. Um, Basically, that way, if you find a backdoor, like, you can't be, I think you have to probably, like, you know, report it, but you can't be charged with going out and finding it. Um, They're protected from revealing classified government surveillance backdoors. They've been added to, oh, oh, that's what it is. They're protected if they reveal that there was a classified surveillance backdoor added to encryption algorithms and communication apps that are utilized by the public. So basically, if you, like, hacking into systems is still totally illegal, but if you pick up, like, Signal as an app and you find out, like, the NSA put a backdoor on it and you publicize that, this would protect you from that. Good. Now, So, like, that's cool. Uh, you you reminded me of something that I wanted to bring up. So it was partly the article, but mostly your comment at the beginning about how we're losing time because we've been doing too much timey wimey stuff. Oh was yeah, recording we have. recently. And to prove that anyone can do it, didn't we have a pretty big fuck up on a recent recording? <laughs> oh yeah, we did. <laughs> so so here's what happened for anybody who listened. Um, not not Jeff's episode, but the two episodes beforehand. Um, Exile got back from Mexico. We sat down, we recorded an episode that we thought was going to air that Sunday. Then we realized that, oh shit, Chris Anders is supposed to air Sunday because that lines up with our guest schedule. (laughs) So we, not only did we announce Chris Sanders in this episode that he was going to be the next week's guest, um, we basically talked like, I think we made some comments about like, I'm very excited to be going to B-Sides Nova and shit like that. Yep. When clearly, like, it was all over by the time that episode aired. Like, we really timey-wimey that shit we, up. 
We we totally lost it. Also, I highly appreciate your use of the word timey wimey. <laughs> I'm, st- well, I'm going to get to you, man. It's going to happen. I still we're going to get you it. there. I still haven't seen an episode. But we're going to get you there. You're starting <laughs> to use the vernacular now. We're going to get you there. Uh, only the one thing that you've taught me. We're going to get you there. <laughs> Trust me. Uh, why don't you come up with another piece of news, uh, hopefully with uh, some time elements attached to it also. Cool. I can actually talk about another piece of news. Um, let's talk about... Uh, honestly, potentially one of the most disgusting pieces of malware that I've ever seen. Um, new malware, and I don't think, I think this has been done before. Um, it totally has, but like this is just something that I've seen, and it's kind of newish. Warping sextortion scams into baits to infect targets with information stealer malware um, and like spreading, asking for, oh wait, this is a different one than the one that I saw. Damn it. All right, we got to talk about both, but I don't have the article for the other one. So this one is using basically like, look at pictures of like, look at my nude girlfriend's pictures. um, And then like spreading malware through that, right? And then you get the Trojan dropper, which downloads exactly. whatever, yeah. There was another one, though, that was required, like it was a crypto, like ransomware kind of thing, that was requiring naked photos to unlock the computer and the files that existed on the computer. Yeah. See what the time stuff. I, I don't remember if we discussed that or if we actually put that on a previous episode. That's the thing. I'm not sure either. <laughs> like the last, the last couple episodes have been all over the place yeah. in the timey wimey sphere of things. Um, we're, we're getting back onto a schedule. Uh, we are. thank you. COVID-19 for helping us get back on a schedule. Also, <laughs> Shame on you, Animal Crossing, for ruining my schedule, because by the time that people start listening to this episode, because tonight at midnight, Animal Crossing comes out. Which is why we're recording tonight and not tomorrow, because it's exactly. not going to be available. Oh, I'm not. Um, so by the time people are listening to this, I'm going to be like knee deep in like my Animal Crossing village, like living on a deserted island, getting away from the quarantine and probably ignoring <laughs> my wife and child like a horrible person. <laughs> No, I would never do that. I cannot ignore my child. I can totally ignore my wife occasionally, though. But she will hit me. Not not in a bad way. I shouldn't say that. Like, she will yell at me. She will gently remind me that I'm ignoring her. There. I love my <laughs> wife. I really do. Um, but, yeah. So, like, we're. Uh, this is the second thing that I've seen that's kind of similar. Like, this one being the nude extortion pictures yeah. versus um, the other one. I wouldn't. I'd actually be surprised if this didn't co-opt for, like, the um the not deep fix uh the i the iCloud hack stuff I yep. can't remember the the street name of it the fappening stuff that's the thing yeah I wouldn't be surprised if like we you didn't see some of that there too so what do you got because I mean I got more but what do you got uh, so I've got something that's uh, actually kind of cool it's uh, not so much uh, bad news uh, did you read this article about Microsoft taking down well the title, uh, World's Most Prolific Malware, like the hacker group behind it. I think um, I did, yeah. So specifically, this is NCURS. So they were able to take down the NCURS malware infrastructure, which is a pretty big thing because NCURS has been making itself a botnet since, what, 2015, 2016? It's, yeah. it's one of those ones that if you look at any sort of threat intelligence feed, there's always an NCURS update for what's the new infrastructure that you need to watch out for. So the fact that they were able to do all of this and take it down is a is a huge undertaking. That is a pretty huge undertaking and a pretty awesome one at that. Yeah. Um, the world is a little bit safer until the next thing happens. Yeah, see, and if I remember right, didn't Incurs, I think Incurs was like uh, big with Game Over Zeus, Dry Dex, Locky. Um, that was like its main delivery stuff. So that's. I don't remember well. Yeah, it. <laughs> either way, it's a big one. Like uh, anyone who's been uh, staying up on this, that's a, it's a big takedown. So that's a. Oh, yeah. It was, what was it? Oh, here it is. Here's the number I was looking for. Six million zombie Ooh. endpoints in the bot. Damn. That's a lot. That is a lot. So, you ready for this? Because speaking of the next thing. Yes. Man, everybody's home under quarantine. People are working remote like never before. Vegas is shut down. When I saw a picture of the Vegas Strip, and it's eerie, man. Like, Vegas has not been shut down since the Kennedy funeral. 
And that was only for like a couple hours. It wasn't for like, you know, 30 days. Seeing Vegas not lit up is fucking weird. But there's pictures of it now. Like, it's a thing. It exists. But you get a whole bunch of really horrible people who are going to capitalize on this. Um, Anything from, like, buying all the hand sanitizer and trying to sell it for a hefty fucking profit. Which, good guy, and, and this is probably one of the only times I'll ever fucking say this. Ever. Good guy Amazon and, like, eBay and those companies for uh, shutting down people who are trying to exploit that system and exploit people who are profiting off of panic. Um, I'm very happy to report that I read several articles about guys who had 17,000 cases or 17,000 like things of hand sanitizer in his garage that no one would let him sell anymore. Like, I'm very happy to report that he wasted money. Good. Because that dude was an asshole. Yeah. But also, especially like some of them, and I just want to point out like the human side, like the shitty human side of this. Some of them were like, Oh, no, I'd do it again. Like, I feel like I'm really, you know, I'm doing a public service. I'm just making a couple dollars for my service, but I'm buying it up in this area that doesn't have a lot of people. And then I'm making sure that people in the city can get it. So, like, the fact that I'm charging $20 for a $1 pile of hand sanitizer, like, I got to pay shipping and, like, my, I have my own costs. Like, I'm doing a public service. Man, I hate people sometimes. So, as we continue down the trend of hating people, um, of course... Digital attackers are weaponizing the shit out of this, um, and it's happening. So you know those maps that are tracking the outbreak? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Soto hackers, they know about them too. So they're actually, like, basically pigeonholing into those maps um, and using those maps to infect computers. So, like, certain websites that you go to, they're using these maps, and then they're stealing information, including, like, usernames, passwords, credit card numbers, and other info stored in your browser. So they're designing websites related to Corona to look exactly like these maps. The hotspot map. Like it shows the map, the hotspot map. And then like prompting you to download an application to keep you updated. And then the application doesn't need installation. It shows you a map. And then that's the front for them to get the rest of the binary installed on your computer. It's super, super shitty. Um, But it's happening. So like if you're looking at coronavirus maps, be very, very careful and be safe. Like... Everything that's coronavirus related right now, look at a second time because every major threat group is using coronavirus. Every crime threat group is using it. Like, just look at anything coronavirus related a second time because then we move into the second one. And this is cool to me. You knew about this. Like, you knew that this has happened before. In all my time doing this stuff, I've actually never seen this. See, I don't know shit. Um, TrickBot and Emotet have been found to start using news clippings from coronavirus stories in their description fields and in their their binary strings to fuck with machine learning algorithms so it makes them harder to detect. For instance, the file description would be like Singapore has 187 confirmed cases of the virus. Product name would be like the restrictions will ban travel to the U.S. from 26 countries. Shit like that. Like... That's really fucking interesting to me. It It's supposed to be useful. Like it's supposed to be there for like AI and machine learning engines. So it's supposed to like trick them up from looking at like file types and stuff and kind of trick them yeah. to be like, oh, it's a coronavirus thing. I wonder like I, I haven't written a machine learning algorithm or AI, but I wonder if some of those don't check those fields just to be blank. Because mm-hmm. I imagine legitimate applications would have legitimate data in there. Typically, yeah. Yeah, so that would be like one of their threshold checks is there's no information in here that moves it up on the threshold. So by copy and pasting, that kind of reminds me of like the heyday of the exploit kits on the internet when they would use public domain uh, novel texts oh, yeah. in their code in order to mess with the the entropy checks and things like that. So it would normalize down into noise and it was much harder to detect. So the article basically says it's not known if use of these strings actually has any benefit. But back in January, and I completely missed this, they were doing the same thing with news stories about Trump impeachment. It makes, um, it makes sense. Like, so if if the average clicked on a phishing email is 33%, when, you know, a third of the people will click an email, something sure. like that, it's going to be what? Higher than 50%? Potentially, yeah. yeah. And like... So this this in turn goes into two things that I, I really love. First off, 
I love doing this show and I, or I love doing this podcast. And one of the reasons that I love doing this podcast is because I didn't know this. This is probably something I never would have known if I wasn't looking for things to talk about on this podcast. <laughs> like it's really cool. And yeah. secondly, like, fuck, nobody knows everything. Like, I don't know shit. I learned something new. Like because of this podcast tonight, I learned something new and that's cool to me. And if you already knew this also cool, like, but I learned something new. So like I go to bed happy about that. Yes. That's awesome. Now the, those articles actually reminded me of something else that I read and forgot to put it in our notes. Um, uh, but there were hackers, you know, how, how we've been talking about healthcare has actually been targeted. And previously that was kind of like a no touch with the criminals and hackers of the world. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, Forbes actually put out an article that the hackers were going to say no more healthcare cyber attacks during the. I saw that today, man. Yeah. I mean, couldn't they just say no more healthcare ever? But yeah, I saw that today. Like that was a surprising little piece of altruism from a group of hackers. Um, surprising, but I mean, I guess everybody has to draw a line somewhere. We'll fuck you up with coronavirus titles, but we won't fuck with the healthcare providers <laughs> until they're not overburdened anymore. Then exactly. if people die, whatever. <laughs> well, I mean, they, these people have families, right? So oh, yeah. if they overburden, if the healthcare gets That's overburdened. That's very true. Yeah, I mean, there's a personal, they have skin in the game in this. Like, just on selfish a human reasons, level. Yeah, I get I, it. It makes sense. Like, <laughs> humans are inherently selfish, I think. We, we want that, so. Yeah, we'll have to dig up that article, too, and share it. Yeah, um, I got I got it. Oh, already. you already got it. Yeah. Cool. All right, you want to share another? Uh yes. So kind of on that uh COVID nineteen realm, I wanted to bring this up because I see how many of our listeners listen on their iPhone. And because of the COVID nineteen, Apple is issued a warning about replacement and repair stuff. Uh the COVID nineteen has severely limited their shipping. So if you break your phone, there is a chance that you will not have a replacement. So don't drop your phone or buy a case that will be highly yes. delayed from Amazon shipping because everybody else is doing that. Yep. Like the world is shut down, people. You could literally go listen to our whole back catalog right now. Like that's a valid use of your time. Mm -hmm. All right. All what right. else you got for us? Maybe you don't want to go do that, but like you could. <laughs> so I want to talk about two cool tools that I found recently. Um, one by somebody that I actually kind of know, and he talked about it at, um, B sides and one that I just kind of found, but I know a couple of people who are over there. So the first one is called email rep.io. So that's R E P dot I O. Basically you plug in an email address and it looks for like, are there any accounts associated with it on the internet? Where has it been seen? What profiles exist? Has there been any malicious or suspicious activity observed? So if I look up my Burns One IP address, I get a low reputation, which it's not blacklisted. There's no malicious activity found. First seen, never. Last seen, never. Um, the domain reputation is low. Of course it is. The only thing that exists on that domain is my email address. But it has like a Twitter and a Gravatar profile. Well, that makes sense because those are the accounts that I have with this thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's just kind of a really cool tool that you could theoretically put to work for you just to, if you wanted to check out an email address, I don't know every bit of their query language. At some point, maybe they'll come chat about this thing and building it. I bet you they would be more than willing to come chat with us about this, but it's kind of cool and it's something worth checking out. So that's email rep.io and we'll link it. The other one is from unit 42, which is Palo Alto, right? They have built this GitHub. That's a playbook viewer. And dude, this thing is so freaking cool. Um, Basically, you kind of go in, you get the playbook viewer, and you select a playbook. And the playbooks are all different threat actor groups. So, like, if I wanted to look at oil rig, it will show me, like, kill chain, like, recon, weaponization, delivery, exploit, install, command, objective, right? And then I can click on it, and it'll give me the MITRE framework piece, and it'll, you know, I'll have a whole bunch of dates. So, like, in January 2018 to February 2018, what did I, what did they see in May 2016 and on? And I can look at like, okay, delivery, spear phishing attachment. Let me take a look at that. Oh, here's all the hashes from that spear phishing attachment. Or I can go say like, okay, we didn't see any command line. We didn't see user execution. Like we don't have any indicators available, but we do have indicators available for a scheduled task. 
and you can go look at those. So you can literally pick through all these different threat groups and look at different indicators and different attack methods that they used. And there's, I don't know, 15 maybe threat groups on this thing. But, man, it's just, it's so cool. I hope they keep building it because I think it's so cool. It is. And uh, Unit 42 has put out a lot of really good stuff. So any- Oh, yeah. Unit 42 is awesome. Yeah. Anytime I see something come out from them, it's something I, I definitely take a look at. Now, this emailrep.io, I'm actually taking a look at it. It's it's interesting. So it's doing an actual touch, right? So it's doing a curl. But it the cool thing is, is it gives the output in JSON. Yep. So you can use it for data enrichment and whatever tools you use easily. Yep. That's, that's legit. It's a cool tool, isn't it? Yeah. So the the guys behind this, um, they have an actual like company that works on email stuff. Um, that's basically like trying to they're they're trying to work on the the like snort for email, is their kind of tagline or like IDS for email. So like a highly customizable rule engine that you can detect malicious emails from with community driven rules. So they put out this email reputation tool as a free tool on top of that to like kind of show some of the stuff that they did. And I think it's a really cool tool. Um, so like two cool fucking tools that you guys can play with and every oh, guys and <laughs> yes. girls and everybody, all people can play with. So what else you got? All right. So, let me get back to that. <clears throat> do, 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 yeah. do, oh, do, uh, do. <laughs> that, this do, is cool. Do, this, do, is, do, do, do. this is just a cool thing. Uh, I've always been kind of a space science nerd for as long as I can remember. So when I saw that the NASA Curiosity rover actually took a high definition panorama photo of Mars, I was giddy like an elementary school kid. Uh, everyone should go take a look at this. This is a fantastic picture. Other than the fact that Mars looks very boring. Uh, but, I mean, it's a legit picture of a planet That's other not than ours. ours. Yeah. Correct. It just looks like a desolate wasteland and looks boring. But it's still super fucking amazing. <laughs> the fact that we've got this high-definition panoramic picture from a robot – uh, on Mars, That's on is, Mars is amazing, right? There's so much technology, so much science, space travel, like so many intelligent people behind that. Um, it, I mean, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about looking at it again. Like it's, I'm looking at it right now. <laughs> I also like that you can see the the rover tracks like yeah. all the way behind it. Um, no, it's super freaking cool, and I've been following the Curiosity stuff. I actually have a a challenge coin that was made out of a piece of the Curiosity rover. Oh, or that's like some of the test units for the Curiosity rover. Like they use some of that metal in it. Uh, call me Jelly. I mean, you can get it on Amazon, I think. Um, but like the the NASA coins that I have are some of my favorite coins because they use materials from like different operations when they're commemorating that operation. Yeah, which I think is super cool. Um, no, I just make the joke because like I hate brown desolation. Like I don't even play post apocalyptic video games because they depress me. Mm-hmm. However. It's still another fucking planet, and it's awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the thing, right? Like seeing the pictures sent, it's like even if it's desolate, there's still that part. Like this is not our home, and we're seeing it almost as if we're there. Someday it might be. We don't know. Or someday our home will look like that. Who knows? <laughs> I'm not going to get into some preachy agenda <laughs> shit. But. Both could exist at about the same time. It's possible. I would expect that if one exists, the other one will probably at least be an attempt. <laughs> all right. Is that all for the news? Uh, looks like it. it cool. Unless you, so do have, you want me to unless you introduce the topic. I, I don't think I do. Do I? The last one that you added just before we started recording. No, I talked about that one already with the, with the Corona stuff. Okay. Yeah, we're good. Already, already done. You can see how prepared we are. <laughs> Um, so I'll, I'll kind of set this pitch up because this is going to be a really interesting one. So when we first started talking about like concepts and things to talk about for this show, this concept of breaking the color wheel came up largely around the term purple team. And like originally exiled and I were vehemently opposed to this entire concept. And then at some point I had like a moment where I was like, yeah, I don't care anymore. Like, I'm fine with it now. So, like, 
we're actually going to kind of debate this a little bit probably instead of like being on the same page because yes. I think this is one of the first topics that we disagree on now, even though we didn't like four or five months ago. Mm-hmm. Lesson to everybody out there, <laughs> be open to changing your mind. Yes. Like I, in my opinion, I only hated this because I wasn't open to changing my mind. And then when I finally like realized that I was being a stubborn prick and we'll talk about that more later, um, I changed my mind. Whereas but anyway, whereas I have like actual personal experience and stuff that I thought through that I dislike about the whole color wheel and have not yet realized that you're being a stubborn prick. <laughs> well, uh, you can't see that I stuck out my tongue in a joking way. <laughs> I was just going to say uh, all the family that I avoid talking to makes it a virtue on how stubborn they are. So it could be true. Mine too, actually. <laughs> so, so do you want to like explain the color wheel and the concept of the InfoSec color wheel so, to people? Yeah, so we have this this color wheel that started with the red team, blue team. Um, I don't know this for sure, but to me, it seems like it's a carryover from the military. There are a lot of beginning people in the industry came over from the military or federal intelligence agencies. So they just use the same terms, um, and it got accepted and expanded from there. Like the purple team, and then they have, what is it, white, So yellow, a lot green. of InfoSec stuff actually comes from the military. Like yeah. Challenge Coins is an InfoSec thing. Patches. Totally a military, a military thing. Patches, thing. Yeah. military thing. Like we get a lot from the military, probably because the military has been at a lot of the forefront of this stuff. Uh, so a lot of that's kind of carried over. Yeah, and that's what I was saying at the beginning. Like this is uh, – that's my – that's my opinion based on observations of uh, history, like reading who founded this, uh, where it was all done, and who brought it to the commercial sector yep. and the private sector. Like, to me, it just logically makes sense. Like, I I haven't had anyone say, yes, that's exactly what happened in this meeting. But to me, that's kind of where it makes sense. Um, but, it, it, of course, once private corporate America got a hold of it, it got expanded. It became a new buzzword. Um, They added, what, six, eight new colors for different aspects of the industry. So Um, let's run down the colors. We'll start with the two traditional. Blue team, defensive security, the defenders. Red team, offensive security, the breakers. Purple team then got added. Integrated, integrating defensive tactics with offensive results. Then green team, enhanced security automation with designing code. Yellow team, software coders and architects, the builders. Orange team, facilitate interaction and education. And white team, Analyst Compliance Logistics Management. So that's the the current image that I've seen that co- that has this color wheel. Yes. So let's outside of the buzzword bingoy stuff. Why do you think this this grew and exists? <clears throat> uh, it uh, I think really it just comes down to it was the first thing there that just got accepted, right? So. People came over, used the terms that they were familiar with in their previous job life. And as they got into corporate America, that's just what they talked about. So it kind of touches on another one of my pet peeves. It, it they're To me, they're concurrent in the sense with this using terms from a previous life and people who abuse acronyms when they're talking to people that most likely do not understand the acronym itself. Uh, I think okay. anyone who can go into a corporate environment, if you haven't worked there for like five years, you have to take like six months to get used to what people are talking about because it's so work specific acronym heavy. Oh yeah. So, so here's the thing. Blue team and red team, I think carried over first and blue team and red team has always made sense to me. Defender attacker. Mm-hmm. They're, they're very different divisions and very different skill sets in a lot of ways. And then like when you get into like green team engineering, same thing. I think purple team was the one that came next. Yes. Right. And I will give you my old anti argument that everybody has the same goal in strengthening security systems. Blue team defends, red team attacks, red team tries to be blue team, blah, 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 so on and so forth. The problem is, is that has built such an adversarial relationship over the years that at some point red team kind of stopped actually trying to make shit better. They just wanted to win. And then blue team started to focus overwhelmingly on what red team was doing. And it just basically built worse security for a lot of places. So when people used to talk about like, oh, I do purple team, I'd be like, well, fuck you. 
because that's bullshit. Because if blue team and red team operated the way they were supposed to operate in the first place, we would have no need for this concept, right? Mm -hmm. That was my argument. Uh, Yeah, and uh, there is some of that still in my head, but I I do want to say this. I'm not against what they stand for, right? Like the integration, everyone working together, that that totally makes sense. And I agree with that operational piece. Um, the, the, um, so I was just being stubborn. I was saying they should function the way that if they function the way they were supposed to, we wouldn't need this. So we don't actually need this. People just need to get over it. That's when I realized I was being a stubborn jackass. And I said, (laughs) you know what? If a fucking word can change the way people look at security, we should use that word. If that actually makes the situation that's not super great better, why the fuck do I have a problem with it? See, it's and, making shit better. And that's where I was going to that's where I was trying to get to with the brain thinking faster than my mouth was talking is um I haven't actually seen it personal experience make it better. I've seen more people get confused using the color wheel terms, uh but when I back it out to try to explain it like uh, Blue Team are the security operations center analysts, your incident response technicians, uh, your forensics people. They understood those words. But when I said Blue Team, Red Team, a lot of people, you know, the majority of people who are not familiar with that military world, uh, they were confused and started to check out of the communica- of the conversation early on because they didn't understand the language that was being spoken. Mm. We're always going to have that, though. Like, it doesn't matter where you go or what it is. We're always going to have our own lingo. But it we're never going to get away from that. But it doesn't mean we can't push ourselves to try to uh, have a way to explain the same concepts and operations uh, in a way that the majority of the people we work with will understand the first time. You want to? You want one of my big pet peeves on on definitions? What? Define incident. <laughs> oh my god i've had way too many conversations with people about what is an oh, yeah. incident. define uh, incident that is my pet peeve we don't have a unified definition no. of fucking incident yep nobody does everybody has a different opinion on what an incident it, does it, and each organization i've worked with it's come down to what does the current CISO define it as exactly and then all the people below him who disagree with that definition and then try to change it anyway like <laughs> That's the thing. Yeah. Like terms are I I would like to eventually move to a point where like if we use these six colors or seven colors or whatever, mm-hmm. that's cool. Let's just standardize that term. Yeah. Let's standardize the meaning of it across the industry rather than like everybody having their own definition. Yeah. And I would also, be, and I would be okay with that if there was such a way that we could communicate it to the rest of organizations and the rest of the people that we interact with so that when we use the term they understand what we're attempting to communicate, right? So, uh, I mean, to be honest, when you're talking to the non-technical people, when I tell people I do defensive information security, most people have no idea what the fuck that means. <laughs> like, yeah. we're never going to have yeah. it make sense to everybody. That's never going to happen. That That is a true statement. Also, I just want to say, purple is a fucking awesome color. Like, that color is dope. It's one of my favorite colors of all time. That's another reason why I'm more okay with it, because I love that color. <laughs> and historically, it's been royalty in Western Europe. Yeah, well, the royalty thing makes me less cool with it. So, like, I try not to think about that. I just think it's an awesome color. It's the color of everybody's favorite Teletubby. Uh, For anybody who's old enough to remember Teletubbies. Eek, oof. Uh, I don't know any of their names. <laughs> I don't know anything about, I don't actually know anything about Teletubbies. Like, I completely missed that. I just think everybody's favorite Teletubby was the purple one. I think everyone remembers the cow print pimp hat and the. Mm. Better pull, better pull than that. <laughs> the smart Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. I'm Leonardo all day. Like, that's just me. Yeah. But like the smart Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle rocked purple. Yep. The analytical one rocked purple. So like, I'm cool with the color purple. <laughs> Um, ultimately at the end of the day, if, if you use the terms, if the terms make you feel better, fucking cool. If the terms make you like remove some of the, the adversarialness also fucking cool. Um, however, if the terms box you in, so if you go, well, I'm only blue team, I can only do this thing. If you let the term box you in, 
you're doing yourself a disservice. Yeah. And and that's where we 100% agree, right? So yeah. uh, even though like uh, maybe it's a West Coast versus East Coast thing, right? Maybe maybe it is a West Coast thing out here that that's still uh, a different environment with using those terms versus something maybe more corporate ease. Um, but yeah, uh, don't get boxed in. And uh, my thing is strive to have clear communication from the beginning. Um, that's why I brought up my little pet peeve about uh, acronyms and that, that this kind of falls in that same place with me uh, because I've seen it get uh, used uh, to – there was a lot of misinformation and miscommunication because not everyone understood the terms that were being used. You know the worst part about it, and I'm going to shoot myself in the foot for everybody that I work with that listens to this, but I don't care. Um, when a term comes up that you have just never come across, but you're, like you're too afraid to ask – um, so like, do you know what an ACL is? And ACL by Alpha Charlie Lima? Yeah. Uh, are you, you talking about, well, <laughs> first off, which industry are we talking about? Uh, our industry, <laughs> our industry entirely. <laughs> so like. Um, so an access control list. Yeah. Yeah. But when I heard people talking, saying ACL all the time, I was like, what the fuck is an A-K-L-E? Yeah. Like, I've never heard this InfoSec term before because my brain went to A-K-L-E. Yep. Like, I've never heard this term before. What the fuck does that mean? <clears throat> and then eventually I was like, wait, ACL. Okay, like, I know what an yep. ACL is. Yeah. Like, I totally know what that means. I've never heard it called an ACL before. Yep. Uh, my, my example when I'm talking to people about how using too many acronyms or things like this cause miscommunication is uh, the, the acronym UPS. Oh, De- yeah, depending, that's fair. The shipping on, company, the power supply. It, it, yeah, it, any number of things. And that's – that. I mean, it's a pretty simple one, but it, it shows the point, right? Like uh, not knowing your audience and using an acronym may get them confused because they don't understand what you're trying to say. Yep. Also, a piece of advice for anybody who comes into a company. One, don't be afraid to ask. And two, more importantly, um, there's going to be lingo there. Yep, like absolutely get used to the lingo. You're never going to get away from having like lingo. Now it's a thing. Now, if you want to come in looking strong, if they don't already have an acronym glossary, be the person that makes it. Yeah. Make so, an ac- acronym yeah. glossary. So then you can go around saying, Hey, I'm new here. I don't know what these things are. I'm going to put it together for a source for everyone to use. So when we get new people, we don't all get confused. Can you explain to me what this means? You better be careful. If you do it too much, you're sliding into white team and nobody wants that. <laughs> Wait, didn't we kind of talk about that a little bit with Jeff <laughs> and how it gives you teeth? I, I mean, no, we talked about GRC giving you teeth. <laughs> um, I'm white team too, apparently. <laughs> um, Leaning, but I mean, white team like sits on top of everything else. It's not like its own thing. Like white team can exist in any of them. So I guess that makes me special. And we could totally spin out about why did they put the color white on top? Right? Why's it got to be white? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've wanted to say that like this whole time, but like I, I didn't at the same time, but now I did. So it's done because right. we don't edit this. So like yeah. it is what it is. It, it's out there. All right. So like, does that mean we should move on to the detection portion? I, I think so. And we actually forgot to dis- discuss this. So I don't know. What do you think about my proposal for... I think your proposal is solid. I think that's good to talk about. We can do that one. <clears throat> All right. So what I what I wanted to bring up here for the detection was telling the difference between a spoofed and a compromised email address. Okay. So first, let's define. Because I realize when like I interview people, a lot of people don't know like the definition of spoofed email. Mm-hmm. So like, let's define that. So spoofed email would be something that is entirely made up. Uh, with the knowledge that uh, it will not actually get a response back if someone were to send like a reply to it. Well, it could because you can modify the reply to field to be something else. Or it's designed to masquerade to look like uh, someone you know and it's not. Spoofed is header modified or header fucked with email. So you went into the header of that email address and you modified it to make it look like it was coming from where it's not with it's a completely different reply to field potentially and stuff like that. It's sometimes like, not even a, there's sometimes no information in the reply to field because they don't care about any sort of response. Correct. 
That is a spoofed email address, something that appears to be from somebody that you know or trust or somebody else, but it isn't. And then a compromised email address is... Tell us. Okay. A compromised email address means that an attacker has physical access to a person's inbox, and they are sending as them, meaning they have compromised that account, and it's actually coming from that person. The way to tell the difference between the two... Oh, I guess that's the detection, but still. (laughs) The way to tell the difference between the two is email headers. Mm Mm-hmm. So email headers will contain sending infrastructure, like where it comes from, as well as like there's there's a field that uh, like the href from or something, the actual from. So the, like from this the, appears to be from this, yeah, and you can actually make that parent. I think it's the x sender field. Yeah. It's very difficult to detect a compromised email address. Um, that's mostly like pattern stuff, right? Like that's really difficult. Um, that person never sends links or like whatever. Yeah. Well, and the thing I was going to say with this too, is if you, if there's an email that seems suspicious, uh, as spammy phishing or whatever, uh, one of the quick checks that I would always do is to see if the re the reply to server was on the same domain as the, uh, reply email address. Sure. That was Um, just, that was just like a quick and dirty check, uh, to put it one way or another. Now, it's very easy and hard to detect a spoofed email address, and there's there's a reason for that. Because a crap ton of companies or a crap ton of services that are offered will send on behalf of someone else and will look spoofed, right? So, like, mm-hmm. if you use a marketing firm, so to speak, or a marketing tool, that marketing tool might be the one sending the email, and it might look like it's coming from your head of marketing. Like, so it can get harder to detect. You actually have to baseline this stuff. Yep. And basically, from a log perspective, if you want to detect it, you're looking for that actual from field, and then you're looking for the uh, the appearance from field, the visible from field. And for fuck's sake, I can't remember the name of them right now. But you're looking for those two from fields, and you're basically looking for differences between those two, and then going in and tuning out the things that are expected or like known services or like Google Groups or whatever mm-hmm. so that you can remove that. No. Um, oddly enough, a lot of attackers will get by this by using things like SendGrid, which are built like common services that yeah. everybody uses. Um so they'll use some of those common services to attack. So it's not foolproof, but like it's a good way to find it. Yeah, and if our listeners want homework, um, a way that you can do proper sending on behalf of and help stop the spoofed, do research into DMARC and DKIM. So that's Delta Mike Alpha Romeo Charlie and Delta Kilo India Mike. Correct. Um and, like, you're all home quarantined anyway, so why not do a little bit of homework? <laughs> we can all learn something. Speaking of which, one other email detection that's important, and it's a bonus, but we're going to pull. Double check everything related to the coronavirus. <laughs> Triple check it, for fuck's sake. Like, it's a big thing yeah. right now, and a lot of attackers are using it. And that's, Check that shit. And that's why I wanted to bring up this detection, because there was a lot of corona- COVID-19 oh my uh, God, stuff yeah. going on. So, like, it's a very relevant thing that's... Uh, important to a lot of people's daily lives. I mean, there are there are bad actors impersonating people who need help from doctors and like targeting doctors. There are people like pretending to be doctors and targeting people. Like there's there's a lot of that going around. You don't need to know all of them. Just know that if you're looking for anything COVID related, um, double triple check it. And also like in your environment, like it might not be a bad idea to do a hunt for emails around COVID. And, like, try to go through those and see if you can find anything that sticks out. Like, you can get some yeah. value from that. And people are really likely to click that shit right now because everybody's panicking. Mm-hmm. Especially at home when they're feeling bored because they can't walk over to the coworker and have a 10-minute chat. Exactly. So on that note, I guess it's about time to end. It looks like it. So thanks once again for listening to us on Detections Podcast. And Hey, wait. No, it's my turn. You brought us in. I get to take us out. And and we are going to cue the exit music here in a minute. <laughs> so everybody go forth and find badness.